Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Andrew Decino, and it is time to uh, let's get into uh, the show. And now it begins. Hello, friends. I hope you are enjoying your Friday so far, because it is Friday in your world, not mine, obviously, since I am... Recording this prior to Friday, and we have, of course, although it is the NFL off season, according to the NFL, it is not the off season when it comes to us here talking shop, talking ball. We have so much football to always talk about together, always, and today is no exception to that. In fact, we are going to be talking about a plethora of topics. Some concerning teams in the uh, NFC West, some containing uh, teams in the AFC East, a general topic, one uh, about age, And then last but not least, uh, we're going to be talking some Sunday night football. And what do I mean by that? Well, you'll have to stick around to segment four to hear that. So, the more descriptive agenda for today, the first segment we're going to be talking about Jimmy Garoppolo and the San Francisco 49ers. And really, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch and Trey Lance are all involved in this too. The San Francisco 49ers were a Super Bowl team. Not winner, but Super Bowl team. One throw away from a championship, probably. In 2019. 2020, it was uh, a lot worse and a lot different. What is the 49ers team going to look like in 2021 with the quarterback situation apparently now unknown? And speaking of quarterbacks, segment two will uh, be about four of them. So New England recently re-signed Brian Hoyer to the veteran minimum, which is about half a million dollars. What does that mean for the other three quarterbacks who are currently on the roster? Cam Newton, Jared Stinham, and newly drafted Mac Jones. The next segment, we're going to be talking more about quarterbacks. And in general, we've seen a wave that Rich Eisen calls the Brady effect. You've seen it in Los Angeles. Los Angeles decided Jared Goff isn't their guy, and they're going to take a shot with Matthew Stafford. Similar to what Brady did in Tampa Bay, a team might say, hey, we're close. We're a Super Bowl team if we get our guy at quarterback, the maybe an older guy. And then you have other teams, like the ones especially who have drafted quarterbacks recently, who are trying to win and capitalize in the window while you have that quarterback on the rookie deal. A very, very affordable quarterback. And so you can stack the team around him. We're going to break down that and 
and what I would probably prefer in segment three. In segment four, Sunday Night Football released an interesting uh, bracket. So for the last 10 years, they have been the number one rated primetime show in America. I love Sunday Night Football. They are the best, in my opinion, of all the major football stations and broadcast networks. And they released the top 16 moments slash games of the past 10 years. And I was looking over the list, and boy, oh boy, did it get my juices flowing for 8.20 p.m. on Sundays during the fall and winter. I love Sunday Night Football. So let's dive first into the first segment, which is all about the 49ers. And you can't talk about the 49ers without talking about Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay, so Jimmy Garoppolo, remember when he was traded from New England in 2017 to San Francisco? And, of course, in 2016, the only two games that he started, he he had started two and won two games. However, in the second game during Brady's suspension, he got injured. He got injured against Miami, and then Jacoby Brissett came and closed it out. Garoppolo played pretty well. He had a 68% completions, four touchdowns, no picks. You know, and he won a couple. He even won a game opening night against Arizona. In Arizona against a good Cardinals team. And throwing a nice touchdown ball to Chris Hogan. Leading a comeback win in the fourth quarter. Having a game winning drive. Then he goes to San Francisco in 2017. Plays in six games. Starts five. Goes five and oh. Seven touchdowns, five picks. Okay, and then in 2018, only plays in three. Had five touchdowns, three picks. But the key stat here is he only played in three games. And the reason was, remember, he made that decision to make a cut to stay in bounds, tore his knee up, and so then he wasn't on the field. So at this point, through 2018, he's been in the league 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. He's been in the league for five years, and he's only started 10 games. The same number as the number on his back. So now the question with Garoppolo becomes, can he stay on the field? And when he is on the field, the next question would be, Is he a quarterback that is capable of playing at a high level and winning games as what the San Francisco 49ers thought they were getting in 2017? And he performed pretty well then. But remember, he was paid a hefty contract after not playing many games. He played and started, like I said, in two games for New England in 2016. Started two games and yet was paid an average salary, I believe, of $27.5 million. That is extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary for not playing and not being durable as the facts show. He is not durable. Now, is the anomaly 2019 when he went 13-3 and and played in all 16 games? Because now you could say, well, when Jimmy Garoppolo is on the field, he does pretty well. Now, of course, wins aren't a quarterback stat. But he did have a rating of over 100 that year. And he had four fourth quarter comebacks. And took the team 
to the Super Bowl against the Kansas City Chiefs. But some might say that the 49er team around him was simply fantastic. And that maybe a average quarterback or slightly above average quarterback could do the same thing as Garoppolo could. A Kansas City Alex Smith could do that and possibly more. And maybe Kyle Shanahan thought so too. Because in his three postseason games in 2019, technically the 2020 calendar year, he threw 19 passes against Minnesota. Nothing spectacular. 130 yards, touchdown, one pick, sack twice, barely 57% completion rate, whatever, words. Then in the next game, in the championship game against Green Bay, he threw uh, eight passes, completed six. So, so far in two games, in his first two playoff starts, he had only thrown a total, a grand total of 27 attempts through two games. Now, that's the guy you're paying $27.5 million to, to only throw the 27 attempts through his first two postseason games. Now, let's compare that to to Tom Brady cuz that's the man he might always be associated with in Tom's first two postseason games he had thrown it 52 times against Oakland and then he had thrown it 18 times before getting injured against Pittsburgh Now that number is 70. And it's not even Tom Brady versus Garoppolo. It's really any quarterback in the postseason is throwing more than eight attempts in a given postseason game. And then in the Super Bowl, we all know, they lost to Kansas City and they blew a 10-point fourth quarter lead. And Garoppolo threw two picks. Didn't help the cause at all. And probably more detrimental than the two interceptions was the missed throw to Emmanuel Sanders down the middle of the the field. That would have scored a touchdown and possibly won them the Super Bowl. So Garoppolo being paid, listen, I'm all for getting paid your money and you are worth exactly as much as someone is willing to pay you. But when you pay a guy $27.5 million and you don't trust him to throw in your NFC Championship game and then he costs you the Super Bowl, some might say, there is reason enough to go and draft Trey Lance. Now, there has been no open book more so than Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch who had a very candid press conference saying that they had tried to make a move for Aaron Rodgers on draft night. Which, remember, we broke down and said, now, although Trey Lance should be a big boy and understand that it is Aaron Rodgers, that can't make your third overall pick feel too good. That they were willing to just trade right out of the pick and go for someone else. Now, I get it. It's Aaron Rodgers. Now, Kyle Shanahan also said, Let's see if we can survive till Sunday. And Kyle Shanahan also just said recently, uh, the, uh, the, the survive till Sunday comment was about the draft. You know, I think some, uh, a reporter asked him a question uh, about, you know, maybe draft choices or draft decisions. And 
He said, let's see if we can even survive till Sunday, the end of the draft. And then recently, Kyle Shanahan was also asked if this could turn into a quarterback competition. If Trey Lance plays out of his mind, could he possibly be the opening day starter? And he said, yeah, every position is up for grabs, he says, including the quarterback position. And But then he did preface it by saying, we don't expect Trey to be ready at that level, but if he is, you know, that's great. They drafted Trey knowing that Garoppolo is going to be the starter. All indications are that Garoppolo is going to be the starter at the beginning of the season. Funny enough, the 49ers think they have a good problem on their hands. Well, what if, you know, well, we have Garoppolo who can start, and we have Trey Lance to eventually replace and supplant him. Well, what if Jimmy Garoppolo plays well? Because the last time that he played an entire season, he went 13-3 and and went to the Super Bowl. Now, that's a pretty dang good year. 13-3 13-3 and three and going to the Super Bowl. So if Garoppolo does that, let's say, again, and the 49ers are the 49ers of 2019, Trey Lance is not starting the game this season. And at what point do you make the move to Trey Lance? Because you also didn't draft third overall to have a guy ride the bench for three, four years. And this situation is comparable to Alex Smith and Patrick Mahomes. Alex Smith turned the Kansas City Chiefs from a 2-14 and 14 team into a playoff team every single year. So when they drafted Mahomes and they replaced Smith in 2018... They better have been pretty sure that Mahomes could successfully do the job and do the job better than Alex Smith, and in a short amount of time. Because otherwise, what does the locker room think of a guy that took him to the playoffs every year? Of a guy who went into New England on opening night, banner drop after 28-3, to beats him, beats the brakes off of him. And the move paid off, as we know, with Mahomes. So if you're San Francisco, you better be sure that Trey Lance is going to work out because if you replace Garoppolo after a good year with San Francisco and Trey Lance starts stinking up the place, you're going to have an issue on your hands. There are guys in the locker room that like Garoppolo. They know that what he's done, that he has taken them to a Super Bowl. That when he's on the field, he plays well. Kyle Shanahan said it. When he is on the field, he plays well. And then he said, but that is when he is on the field. And he said, drafting Trey is going to be good because if Jimmy gets hurt, then we're not going to be left, you know, twiddling our thumbs or incapable of doing anything as they were last year once Jimmy got hurt. They, they got off to the 3-3 three and three start and then uh, a war that starts with S and ends with a T hit the fan. So Kyle Shanahan, what is it? Is Trey Lance an insurance policy for Garoppolo? Like you alluded to when he might get hurt. Or is this a scenario where no matter what, Trey is going to start after one year. Because I'm telling you, as much as it seems like a good problem to have two quarterbacks and two quarterbacks who you like playing well, it is not a good problem. If Jimmy G plays well and you want to make a move to Trey Lance, you better be darn sure that Trey Lance will play at a high level. Now I get it. You think that there's a ceiling with Garoppolo, right? Because he did miss that throw to Emmanuel Sanders. There are limitations that you think. Kyle Shanahan likes these 
exotic offenses, high-powered. Think back to the 2016 Falcons, even. That was Shanahan's offense. So Shanahan wants to be able to do things that he can't do with Garoppolo. Yet Garoppolo is the safe option, but Lance is the guy with a high ceiling. So for the 49ers, what do I think happened to them in 2021? Well, you're going to be in a darn tough division. You have the Seahawks. You have the Rams. You have the up-and-coming Arizona Cardinals. This is no pushover schedule by any means. And if we want to quickly do a a little breakdown of their schedule for the up-and-coming year, well, they play the Lions. Should be not bad. They play the Eagles. Then they play the Packers. Now, they could be 2-0 and heading into this game. And listen, if Aaron Rodgers is going somewhere else, then I could see them winning this game. So uh, uh, right there is an uncertainty. Then they play Seattle. And those games are always great. Those games are always competitive. And I'll, I'll say that the Seattle and 49ers games are split based on home and away. I, I might just say that all these division games are split home and away. Home team wins, away team loses them. Because then they have the uh, the Cardinals next week in Arizona. Then they have Indianapolis, which I think San Francisco can beat. Chicago is tough. Arizona again. The Rams are going to be hard. Jaguars, they should win. Vikings, they should win. Seahawks again. Bengals, I think they could and should win. Falcons, they could and should win. Titans are going to be tough. Texans, they'll win. And then Rams again. So again, I'm giving three division losses. I am giving a loss when they face the Bears. That's four already. And I'll give a loss to either the Titans or the Packers, depending on on if Aaron Rodgers plays, and, and possibly both if Aaron Rodgers plays. So I, I'm somewhere between four and five losses for the 49ers. So if the 49ers go 12 and five, tell me what happens to Trey Lance. I guess you'll have to see and wait for the playoffs. But if this is a an NFC championship caliber team. If they go toe-to-toe with the Bucks in the NFC championship, what's going to happen with Garoppolo? I'd like to see that. I think it's very interesting what's going to happen with Garoppolo because Garoppolo is not happy right now. Let's see if Garoppolo, with a fire lit underneath him, to see how he performs. I'm going to be excited. That is for certain. And one thing else is for certain, we're going to have a segment two after this up-and-coming break where we are going to be talking about Brian Hoyer being re-signed to New England and what that means for the Patriots quarterback. Find out right after the break. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the show. I hope you had a great commercial break. 
and are ready to dive back into quarterbacks in the NFL. The most important position, some might say. Actually, all should say, because it's true. The first segment, we talked about two quarterbacks, Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance. We deduced whether Trey Lance had a shot at starting, but we didn't really have to dig deep into it because Kyle Shanahan told us that, yes, he does. If he plays, you know, every position is open for battle. He can outduel Jimmy. And what does that mean for the locker room? What does that mean if Jimmy G starts and plays well? Well, we broke that down in segment one. Now it's time to break down what seems like a menial signing at first. But really, it has a lot of implications. It is Brian Hoyer signing or coming back once again, re-signing with the New England Patriots at the veterans minimum. So now the quarterback room in uh, Foxborough is Cam Newton, who is the presumed starter as of now according to sources inside that building. It is Jarrett Stidham, Brian Hoyer now, and the newly drafted Mac Jones with the 15th overall pick. Last year, it was Stidham and Hoyer on the roster before Cam was signed. Brian had the belief that he had a chance at the Starting job. Then Jarrett got hurt. Then Cam got signed. And it was Cam's job to lose. Which he didn't. Played 15, started 15 games. Hoyer got one. That was the at Kansas City game. When Hoyer primarily played the first half. Had that horrible end-of-half debacle while taking a sack, which cost them points. And then Stidham came in and didn't do too hot either in the second half. So, Brian got one start. Stidham got none, and Cam got 15. Brian re-signs this time with the, not the expectation that he's going to start. He understands there is no shot of him starting. He is signing primarily to be a mentor and a knowledge source for Mac Jones, I believe. The Patriots quarterback coach right now is the same as their offensive coordinator, Josh McDaniels. Now, normally that that's fine. It has been that way in the past, too. Josh McDaniels has been the offensive coordinator and the quarterback coach, but those times have been when the quarterback was Tom Brady. When the Patriots had a quarterback coach last year and the year before, they used the quarterback coach for the young guys in the building. And he would kind of take time away from normal practice and hold up cards for the young guys and and kind of just make sure they understand the offense, know where the reads are, know where the looks are. And, And that was how they occupied their time. That's how the young guys learn the offense. Because you're not going to stop main practice for a new quarterback to learn basic things. No, they would take him aside and, and learn with the quarterback coach. Now that they have Mac Jones, they're not going to waste Josh McDaniel's time by taking him to a separate field, making him learn the plays. Because there, there Josh McDaniels has many other things to focus on. And he's going to be with the starting quarterback, whoever that is, week one. Probably Cam Newton. So they signed Brian Hoyer to the veterans minimum, likely to be a coach, to help coach Mac Jones, to help Mac see what goes on on a daily basis, 
to get ready to be a quarterback in the NFL. He'll help him learn the offense. Hoyer has been there in New England on many separate occasions. He's been with Tom. He's been without Tom. He knows how the system works more than any quarterback in that building. More than Stidham, more than Cam, of course, more than Mac. And Brian can be used as a guy to who is now willing, as we know, to tutor and teach because he re-signed with three other quarterbacks in the quarterback room. So Brian knows that he's not starting. He knows that his job is to tutor, and he's okay with that. What does that mean for Cam Newton? Cam Newton, as we broke down last year, maybe not you and I, but I certainly did, Cam Newton, when he was signed to that football team, he was going to be the starter or he was going to be cut. There was no in-between. Because Cam doesn't have the personality to be a backup. Coaches knew that around the league. That is why Cam was not signed by anyone else besides New England. Because if Cam wasn't a starter, I don't think they wanted to deal with who Cam Newton was as a backup quarterback. So signing Brian Hoyer means Brian is there to teach Mac, which likely means Mac is probably not going to be ready for week one. They understand they want someone to take Mac to the side, teach him the ropes, Teach him what's going on in the system. Cam will probably start week one, I would imagine. Bill Belichick loves Cam Newton. We've analyzed that. We don't know why he loves him so much because he can't throw the football proficiently. But he loves them nonetheless. And so the court, the Patriots aren't going to carry four quarterbacks on their team. They're not. They hadn't done so since 2000 when Tom Brady was drafted. They're probably going to part ways with Jared Stidham. Because net, net, right now, Hoyer and Jones, Mac Jones, are the two untouchables. You drafted the guy, Mac Jones that is, and you just signed Brian Hoyer. So let's leave those two out of the equation. So now it's, okay, are you going to part ways with Cam Newton, which would make sense. Because, like we said, Cam can't not, probably is not going to be a backup quarterback. And he probably wouldn't be very willing to be a backup quarterback either. And Cam's, in his eyes, is probably put up with a lot. A lot of tough coaching. A tough year. Drafting a quarterback. And then on top of that, to be told that, hey, do you mind also mentoring Mac Jones? He's probably not going to do that. He has enough things to focus on. So I think if they could, what are the possibilities of Jarrett Stidham being the opening, opening day starter? Because who I carry in my quarterback room is, I mean, if Mac Jones is is completely ready, then really you could depart with both Stidham and Cam. Probably. And then just roll with Mac and Brian. But that doesn't seem like it's going to be the case. He's a rookie quarterback. It's a complex system. Or maybe the Hoyer signing was used to accelerate the development of Mac Jones and say, you know, we don't want to have Cam as a backup. So we're going to cut him after the uh, June whatever deadline when uh, his money becomes free to cut. So Brian could be a, obviously Brian Hoyer is not there to start football games. He could be there to accelerate the development of Mac Jones. 
And then do you have Cam as your week one starter? And what if Cam goes one and three and starts skipping balls on out routes? Do you just cut him and make Mac the starter? With Jarrett as the backup and Brian as the mentor, third string slash coach? It's very tricky because, and, and I'd say the trickiest part of this equation, shockingly, is Jarrett Sidham. Because what do you do with him? Obviously, he's on his rookie deal. They didn't trust him to start a single game, yet there were reports in 2019 that he was practicing better than Tom Brady. So is there a chance that, you know, Jarrett did have an injury last training camp, and that's probably what kept him from starting. And probably from learning and developing and like normal people do during a training camp. Could Jared play his butt off? Be the guy that they were, you know, hoping he could be when there are rumors that he was practicing better than Tommy in 2019? I mean, possibly. I, I, I think those chances are small. And I think it would probably be the easiest situation or scenario, just logistically from moving on from Cam or moving to Mac Jones, that is, is if you cut Cam whenever he is the cheapest to cut, you start Jared Stidham for the first week, uh, assuming that he has improved somewhat, and then that makes moving to Mac Jones very, very easy whenever you want because no one's going to be questioning moving from Mac Jones to Jarrett and Jarrett could then back up. Jarrett has the ability to back up. Cam, and and again, I don't know Cam's personality. I don't. I'll admit it. But it seems like a lot of people do. And whenever they talk about Cam's personality, they always make reference that he probably would not be a good backup. That there would be a lot of attention drawn to him. That he probably wouldn't be a great role of a mentor. So, if you start Jarrett and he plays well the first few weeks of the season, that's great. It gives Mac time to learn more. And and even if Jarrett Stidham goes like two and two, three and one, five and three, whatever record you want, you can still move on to Mac Jones whenever you want because he's the fifteenth overall pick and he was your first round selection. He's your guy. He's your future. And meanwhile, Jared can get ready during training camp. He can improve. You can have Mac off to the side with Brian learning more. And without Cam, that probably would make the most sense. Because if Cam goes three and one, or, you know, even better than that, just looking at the first month of the season, that's what I'm doing here by these two and two, three and one records, looking at September. I'd assume that it'd be difficult to transition to Mac without cutting Cam completely. Again, when in whatever scenario Cam is not starting, he has to be cut. So, would you rather cut him in June, let's say? Or would you rather cut him in mid-October? It'd, it'd probably be easier to cut him in June instead of cutting him midway through the season. So my proposal for the New England Patriots would be cut Cam whenever it is easiest to. And then... Start Stidham if you want. You could start Mac if you want. And it just makes life a whole lot easier when trying to break down the quarterback 
situation and the quarterback room for New England. Now, what do I think Belichick wants to do? What do I think Kraft wants to do? Kraft was asked about Mac Jones, I think. And he was saying, you know, do you think Mac is going to start? And I forget what. Um, he said, who do you think should start? You know, should Mac Jones start? And he said, I pay Bill a lot of dollars. It's his job to start. And by the way, I like Cam Newton too. So, you know, this is a an interesting situation too because now you have the owner. And it was probably a subtle jab by saying we pay Bill Belichick a lot of money. Now, listen, I'm sure he was happy paying Bill Belichick a lot of money when he was winning Super Bowls. Six of them, in fact. But then he spends a quarter of a billion dollars signing players, drafts a quarterback, Mac Jones, because he said he needed to address the quarterback room, of course. And you still pay Bill Belichick a ton of money, and you go seven to nine. That's a wake-up call. Now, the last time there were fans in the stands in New England was when their Hall of Fame quarterback, Tom Brady, was starting. How do you think they're going to tolerate a subpar performance from Cam Newton or even from the team in general? I think Robert Kraft is not going to tolerate it. I think the fans aren't going to tolerate it. But it seems like the person who likes Cam Newton the most is actually Bill Belichick, right? He's been an avid defender and supporter of Cam throughout the entirety of this. But if he's skipping balls into the dirt and then the third home game of the season for those season ticket holders and all those fans is number 12, Tom Brady comes into the building. And if he rocks your world, I mean, it, trouble. Trouble is uh, is brewing. Like, this is, this is a, a very, I think it's not an easy situation. Seems like the owner does like Cam Newton, too. He still said, you know, the reason they drafted Mac, he said we need to address the quarterback room. It wasn't cutting it. So they drafted Mac, but he likes Cam. Bill likes Cam. But having Cam makes it difficult to move on to Mac. It it just simply does because I don't think Cam is going to be a backup. Do you disagree with me so far? Do you see Cam Newton being a backup quarterback or mentoring someone. Cam is still young. He was an MVP in 2015. He believes in himself. He's been working with Tom House. He's been working to improve his throwing mechanics. He wants to play as a starting quarterback in the NFL, and I don't blame him. Although he was 30th out of 33 eligible quarterbacks in QBR, he believes in himself. And if you don't believe in yourself, why isn't anyone else going to believe in you? I support Cam Newton for wanting to start in the NFL. I don't think he wants to go the Joe Flacco route and just kind of dwindle off into the, you know, pick up your paycheck as a backup quarterback and and and, and stumble and bumble along the NFL years after you were last productive. That's the Joe Flacco route. Cam believes in himself. I I, I fully support that. But it's gonna be hard to have flexibility at quarterback if you have Cam Newton on your roster because he's not going to be a backup. And let's say he is not productive and you want to move to Mac. Can you trade Cam Newton? I don't think so because if Cam's not productive and you want to move on to Mac, that means Cam's unproductive and probably won't get a lot for him in trade value. In fact, no one wanted to even sign him last year before he went 7-9 and nine or... or seven and eight, whatever his official record was. So before that dismal season from the Patriots, no one wanted to sign Cam Newton. Would anyone want to trade for Cam Newton if he plays bad and gets replaced by Mac Jones? I don't see it. I don't see it being feasible. I'm sorry. So this Brian Hoyer signing makes things interesting because you cannot probably carry four quarterbacks on your roster you have Brian and Mac as the two guys who are unmovable. Jarrett is cheap. 
and Cam probably will be on the roster if he starts. Could you go an entire year without starting Mac Jones? That That is a, another question for another day. Now, speaking of quarterbacks, the next segment we're going to get into is would you rather be a team with trying to win with a quarterback on your rookie deal or signing a veteran quarterback such as what the Buccaneers did with Tom Brady. What works better? What has a better shot of winning you a Super Bowl? We'll break down that next, and we'll also break down the Sunday Night Football bracket. Like we mentioned at the onset of the show, it's going to be a fun topic. Tune in for that right after the commercial break. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. program. This, as a reminder, is the GSMC football podcast brought to you by the good folks at the GSMC podcast network. So we've had an enjoyable first two segments, or at least I have, and maybe you're just tagging along for the ride and this has been a horrible episode for you and you hate talking about the 49ers and Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance and you're just sick and tired of hearing about the Patriots quarterback situation and You couldn't give a you-know-what about Mac Jones or Cam Newton or anything. Hey, that's what we talked about in uh, segments one and two. I thought it was pretty interesting. I do. Quarterbacks are fun. They are what makes the NFL a billion and billions dollar industry. So many jobs revolve around football, and what makes it so interesting is The play of the quarterback, it is no longer three yards in a cloud of dust. I think that football would probably lose a lot of viewership if it was that kind of football day in and day out. You know, of course, the occasional 6-6 tie, like you saw in uh, Arizona back in 2016 when the Seattle Seahawks played the Arizona Cardinals and that game went to overtime and there are a couple missed kicks and there you go six to six tie ball game the occasional one of those are are pretty entertaining and fun I will admit but if every ball game was six to three or ten to three I think you'd be pretty bored pretty fast but to keep you from losing interest or prevent you from having insane boredom How about we talk more about QBs? So there's been a topic that has been fun to think about. 
if you are starting your NFL team, or let's say you are trying to get to and win a Super Bowl, as all teams' goals should be, and we know some aren't, some are probably just more in it to be competitive and make money and, you know, football is a business. But let's just say that football and football teams, their main goal is to win and win football games. Well, how do you do that? Well, the most important position on the field is the quarterback. So would you rather, we'll describe two scenarios. Would you rather do what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers did? You have Jameis Winston, you go 7-9, and nine, you say, you know what? We're actually not that far out here. We're not that far off. We are pretty dang near close. Got Evans, we got Godwin. Todd Bowles just made our defense really, really good in the last half of the season. Todd Bowles is a... Uh, He's done a pretty good job. We have this young stud, Devin White, who's been mentored by Levante David. Yeah, we, we're pretty pretty close here. Let's go get ourselves Tom Brady. Or would you rather go the route of what the Seattle Seahawks did in 2013 and almost worked in 2014? It is you have a rookie quarterback or or a quarterback on his rookie deal, as Russell Wilson was. And you build a very competitive and strong team around him. That Legion of Boom defense was kept together based on Russell Wilson's rookie deal. Even... In 2012. How about Joe Flacco? The Baltimore Ravens. They had a fabulous team. The Ravens did. So there are multiple strategies to try and achieve the same goal. And we can take this criteria and try and apply it to other teams who might be on the cusp. Now, let's take the Denver Broncos, for example. They seem to be in the news for wanting to acquire Aaron Rodgers. They would be going the Tom Brady route. The let's acquire a older guy. We have a good team around us. We have stud wide receivers. We have a great tight end. And man, Denver defense, you know they can usually play. The Broncos have done this before. They did this when they had Tim Tebow. And they replaced him with Peyton Manning. It's not every day that a Hall of Famer, a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer, becomes available. And then, yeah, you have Tim Tebow who won you a playoff game, but you you move on pretty quickly when Peyton Manning comes knocking and he says, hey, I may have only four years with you here, but let's go try and win some Super Bowls. Of course, they got to 2-1-1, and so I'm sure John Elway and the Denver Broncos are looking at that and said, worth it. Yeah, that was worth it. And now they're probably looking at this again with the chance to get Aaron Rodgers. Again, an older quarterback. 38 years old, I believe. They could say, yeah, you know, I don't know how many years he's going to play. But it could be worth it to be in the playoffs most likely every single year that he plays with that team around him and to compete for Super Bowl championships. I I think they'd say worth it. But then you take a look at a team like uh, Miami. Miami has a very good football team around them. They had a fantastic draft. They have made smart moves 
They have a great head coach. And now they have a young quarterback, Tua Tagovailoa. And they'll probably be able to sign these guys and keep the team around while Tua is on his rookie deal. But would they rather have Tua or maybe a veteran guy? What if what if a vet came around? And that's what the Rams were thinking, because the Rams had a great team around them. They said, you know what, Jared Goff's just not our guy. He's not our guy. And they went and tried to get Matt Stafford, and they did. And they think that Matthew Stafford is an upgrade, which most people would have consensus on. And they said, well, let's see if we can pull the Tom Brady route or the Peyton Manning route and use a 10-year vet instead of the guy that we drafted, paid, and now regret that we have paid. That's what the Indianapolis Colts tried to do last year with Phillip Rivers. They tried to say, we have a good team around us. Let's go and get a veteran, Phillip Rivers, and let's see if he can bridge that gap to improve our football team. He did improve the football team from what it was before, which was Jacoby Brissett and Brian Hoyer. It was an improvement. So, what strategy would you rather implement? Because we just saw five teams take a first-round quarterback in this past year. Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Mac Jones, and, of course, Justin Fields. I went out of order for the last two. But let's leave, for example, Jacksonville and the Jets out of it right now. Because those teams... I think are a little farther off than the rest. So the 49ers are a perfect, perfect team to explore, and we explored them in segment one. We have Jimmy Garoppolo, and you can say that he is the veteran, right? He was drafted in 2014. He is uh, the vet. And now at this point, they have a decision. Now you have Trey Lance. This is a guy on his rookie deal. You could part ways with Jimmy Garoppolo, save yourself a ginormous amount of cap space, and then go with the rookie, keep that Super Bowl caliber team around you for a few more years because Trey will be on that rookie deal, and then see if you can get back to what you did in 2019, which was get to the Super Bowl, and then, of course, the ultimate goal being win it. Next, in in chronological order, was the Chicago Bears. The Bears are are and were a good football team as of last year and heading into this year. Think about it. They went with Mitchell Trubisky and Nick Foles last year. And they made the playoffs. They went 8-8. Eight and eight. And, you know, they lost in the wild card round pretty handily to the Saints. But even with Mitchell and Nick Foles, they were able to get to the playoffs. So that's not bad. That's that's not bad at all. In fact, they started 3-0 and and were at one point 5-1. And mind you, they beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But then you lose to, so you obviously know you have a good team around you, then you lose to, you know, the Rams, the Saints, the Titans, the Vikings, all in a row. And then the Packers, and then the Lions. That was six losses in a row that dropped them to five and seven. And then they finished out the month of December going four and one into January. 
So now the Bears think to themselves, well, we could try and get ourselves a veteran quarterback. I think they did try and do that in Nick Foles last year. But now they're deciding for themselves, let's scrap the veteran quarterback idea and let's go get ourselves a rookie that we think and of course, everyone, when they draft a player, they, they you draft them because you think they can add value and success to your team. They think that Justin Fields will be the difference maker as well as a bargain at quarterback, as rookies are in their first four to five years. And so that's the route they're going. And then the last quarterback in the first round, Mac Jones. New England spent a quarter of a billion dollars in free agency. And even last year, they went the route of the veteran quarterback. They had Jared Stidham, and they decided, you know, we'll go vet quarterback here. Let's see if we can't plug the hole of Tom Brady. You know, we still got Julian Edelman. We have Nikhil Harry. We don't know what we have in him. We have Sonny Michel, and we have a really good defense around him. Let's see if we can play hardball, ground and pound, and get this Cam Newton, who's a veteran at this point in his career, and win some football games. That didn't work. So they went veteran route. And then they failed the veteran route, and they went rookie route now with Mac Jones, which I'm sure is cost-effective given they just spent a quarter of a billion dollars in free agency. And so now we have broken down some recent and, and current decisions that teams are making, whether they want to go with a rookie or veteran. And so you say, well, in the last 10 Super Bowls, has it been the veteran route or has it been the rookie contract young player route? And so in 2010, right, it was Rodgers and Roethlisberger. And at that stage in their career, Both relatively young guys. Roethlisberger, of course, came to the league in 2004. Rodgers was the 2005 draft. At this point in their career, they, you know, they were still sub 30, I believe. Although they were paid contracts, so they were not on their rookie deals. And then the following year, it was uh, Eli Manning. Getting the best of Tom Brady. Again, another 2004 draft class in Manning. And he was probably approaching right around 30. Then we already gave the example of Joe Flacco winning it in the 2012 Super Bowl. I believe that was his rookie deal. And that was the season that got him paid, I think, 120 or $160 million. That, that postseason run. And he was going against Colin Kaepernick, another guy. Rookie deal. The following year, Russell Wilson, the man on his rookie deal, beat the veteran Bronco strategy. 2013 is a prime example. You go with the rookie contract, build the team around him, versus the let's spend now big on the veteran and not care where our bank account is four years down the line. It worked. And then, of course, the next Super Bowl, you have Tom Brady. You know, it wasn't a team acquiring a veteran at that point. And then he got the best of Russell Wilson. But it shows you that Wilson was competitive. In back-to-back years going to the Super Bowl on his rookie deal. And then there is that stretch of you had to pay Russell Wilson... And you remember, where were the Seahawks in 15, 16, 17, and maybe 18? They kind of, they were always, you know, hey, we're the Seahawks. We're going to give you a tough fight. But they weren't the Seahawks of the Super Bowl days. Once they paid Wilson, it, it, things had changed. And then 2015, the veteran strategy work paid off with the Broncos. They beat Cam Newton. And then, you know, the next year it was Brady. But let's go to 2017. It was Nick Foles on the Eagles. And Carson Wentz starting most that season. Then the next year, Brady. 
But you see the Rams, their golf strategy got them to the Super Bowl. And then the next year, it was Mahomes and Garoppolo, both guys on their rookie deal, both guys getting to the Super Bowl, and of course, Mahomes victorious. So, yes, there's a lot of Brady in there which throws things off. But if you're a team, what would you lean on doing? In my opinion, if if the veteran is not a Manning or a Brady or a Rodgers, I don't think it's worth doing. I don't think going the Stafford route was necessarily right for the Rams. I think if, for example, when they're for the hot second, Russell Wilson seemed like he was available. I think that would be worth it. Russell Wilson would be worth it to me. Aaron Rodgers would be worth it to me. The Buccaneers obviously think Brady was worth it. And he is. Now, would a Roethlisberger be worth it to you? That's that's probably the fringe where I'm at right now. That's the line of demarcation where I would no longer go uh, the veteran quarterback route. And then I would probably just go and go try and do the rookie quarterback strategy. And there's a lot of young guys in the league right now, and we're trying to see if they are going to if it, if the rookie strategy, the rookie deal is going to work, think about this 2018 draft class. You know, this this is another huge year. I say the third year is usually important for, you know, players, but their fourth year is just as important. Think about Josh Allen and Baker Mayfield. You think their teams want to know if they're comfortable paying them loads amount of money? Because once you pay them loads amount of money, which they're both probably going to get, Anyways, once you pay your player a ton of money, that handcuffs you a little bit financially for the salary cap. And so you need to make sure that that quarterback is good enough to overcome the financial burden that will inevitably restrict the players that they will be able to sign. Right, I mean, Patrick Mahomes getting paid an extraordinary amount of money. He is good enough to overcome the lack of players that they were able to sign or depth because of his contract. Same with Rodgers when he signed his big deal. But obviously not golf, right? That That is the difference right there. Is your guy good enough or not? Now, Josh Allen, I certainly think, is going to be good enough, and I think the Bills should and will pay him a ton of money. I think a really interesting situation would be the Browns. Yeah, he got them to the playoffs and won a playoff game. Fantastic by Baker. And he really improved from year two to three. But how much money is he going to want? And are you going to keep that team around him? If you pay him a lot of money, it, it is going to be really interesting. Now, I may have have a uh, biased opinion because of Tom Brady, but I, I think that going the veteran route is probably, right, if I'm trying to be objective, only useful for about four to five, I'd say maybe four quarterbacks in this league if they became available, maybe five. Who are who are veterans right now, right? Brady, Rogers, Wilson, and 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 of course, you know. I guess you could consider Mahomes a veteran now. He's not on his rookie contract, and neither is Watson. And boy, Watson probably deserves another segment here soon. But there's a handful of guys. Other than that, I I think that the draft a quarterback strategy is probably going to get you to the route of the Super Bowl. Have a great team. Draft a young guy. 
keep the young team around because you can afford them. Let's see. I mean, only time will tell. And Brady's kind of really throwing off all these metrics too, just because he's always there. But that is um, that's the, really the debate between new and old quarterbacks. If you disagree or want to further this debate, uh, please, please tweet me or Facebook me or anything, really. I am here to talk and would love to. All right, next segment. I had previewed the Sunday Night Football bracket of the best moments and games of the past decade. I'm not going to go and do the bracket, you know, one by one, because that's a little boring, but I'm going to revisit each of those moments, and and I'll tell you where I, who I think are early favorites to win that bracket. This is all coming up right after the break. Enjoy. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to our incredible program that we have together. I'm Andrew Decino, and I like football. That's why I'm talking about football. And again, this is the last segment of the show. Now, do I need to rehash everything that I've you know gone through thus far? Sure, I could, but I'll keep it brief because this segment I, I, I do want to spend a ton of time on. We talked about the state of the 49ers. What happens if Garoppolo plays well? When do you start Trey Lance? Is there turmoil in the locker room when you make that switch? Then we went and talked about the Brian Hoyer re-signing in New England and what that really means for the quarterback room because we assume that the Pats won't carry four quarterbacks on their team, but right now they have Cam, Stidham, Hoyer, and the newly drafted Mac Jones. So what is going on there? Then we just talked about new versus old quarterbacks. Would you rather try and win with a quarterback on their rookie deal or maybe go the route of what the Broncos did in 2012 or what the Buccaneers just most recently did? And maybe whatever team is trying to acquire Aaron Rodgers right now, that route. And now we're going to be talking about a decade of Sunday nights. So... Sunday night football is, it's got to be the best part of my football week. It really is. You know, Thursday nights are always great. Thursday night football, because that's the start of the week and, you know, builds anticipation for the weekend. And obviously the, you know, there's a whole great slate of games and the late window on, on Sunday on CBS is pretty great with, you know, Nance and Romo. Monday night football is not what it used to, I'll be honest. When it was Tariko and Gruden, my juices would flow for that one. I would get pretty amped. I would. but And now Monday Night Football is just a disaster, to be honest. But nothing would ever get me as pumped up as Sunday Night Football with Al, Chris, and Michelle. I'd listen to Football Night in America and watch it with Tony Dungy. And now it's Mike Tariko. It used to be Bob Costas. Rodney Harrison, you got Chris Sims and Mike Florio, Liam McHugh. They even brought in uh, Kornacki for a couple uh, weeks, too, to do the playoff predictions. Man, I love everything about that NBC football broadcast, everything about it. I rewatched Sunday Night Football games. I remember during the COVID uh, quarantine season, probably about a year ago, Sunday Night Football did football week in America where every single day during the week they would play 
two games, two Sunday Night Football classics. I think they would air one at six and the next at nine. And these were just classic Sunday Night Football games. And I I would rewatch the entire thing. Knowing the result, knowing even if it was a game I had watched, rewatched five times before, which, which yes, I'm crazy and I have done before. There are certain games, it's like a good movie. You know the result of the movie. So why do you rewatch it? It's just, it's a certain feeling and enjoyment that I get from watching certain football games, and I can rewatch them over and over. Some games I just won't ever rewatch, and, and not because they lost. It, it could be a great win. It's just, I don't know. But if it's a Sunday Night Football game, the chances are of me re- re- wanting to rewatch it pretty high. Or if you even flip it, if there's a game I rewatch, the chances that it was a Sunday Night Football game is pretty high. Really, it is. So, Sunday Night Football, in honor of celebrating a decade of Sunday Night Football being the number one show in primetime, they put together the best moments over the past 10 years. And they did the top 16 so they could do a bracket. But why don't we take a look at the list? And I'll, I'll say some some favorites. And I'll go I'll go from 16 down to 1. So, the 49ers clinching the 2019 NFC West in Seattle on the goal line tackle. Now, they list this as a moment, but the entire game was spectacular. Remember, this game came down to it was... Wilson throwing a ball to the goal line. Jacob Hollister caught it, and as he rolled over, Seattle fans might think he crossed the goal line and scored a touchdown, but San Francisco fans, as well as the referees, ruled he was down short, and the clock expired. It hit triple digits, went to zero, and the 49ers clinched the division. Game over. But the entire game, guess who came back to town? It was Marshawn Lynch who was back in action for the Seahawks. And boy, oh boy, did those fans get riled up for that. That was a spectacular game and a spectacular finish, too. This was game 256. It was the last game of the regular season and of the 100th NFL season. And it came down to this goal line stand. Seattle enjoys their fair share of games that come down to the one-yard line. And this one, again, got the better of them. There are angles that might show that Hollister crossed. I might even be able to be convinced that Hollister crossed that goal line. I'll be honest. But that was an incredible game. And I think Seattle even was down at one point in the fourth quarter, 26-14. to And they came scratching their way back, only to be a couple of inches short. That game was ranked 16th in that moment. But I think that one might be a lot higher on my list. 15, they have Drew Brees throws touchdown in 48th straight game in 2012. See, that that is neat because it's Drew Brees' 48th straight game. But the game itself it was nothing special to me. In fact, this game, and for someone who watches so much Sunday Night Football, didn't didn't do much uh, for me. Didn't do much for me. Uh, I, I, that might be just pretty low. It might not, not even have made my top 16. Brady outduels Mahomes in first meeting. That's, uh, that's a game I was at, and this is ranked 14th on their list. I was there. The Patriots got out to a big lead. I believe at one point it was 24-9 to at the half. And then Mahomes roars back. Tyreek Hill had the hat trick. The game in the second half flipped a couple times. The Chiefs took the lead at one point. And then Brady just says, all right, young young one, watch this. And remember at this point, 2018, Gronkowski wasn't really feeling himself, but Brady saw Gronk one-on-one, hooked up with him. And then with time expiring, Steven Gostkowski sent the Foxborough faithful home happy. And 
Mahomes, the hot young stud, was silenced in that game and, and suffered his first loss in 2018. And I, I thought that was a classic. I love that game. This is a game that I have rewatched several times. I, I have rewatched the 49ers Seattle game several times, just so you don't think I'm a, you know, well, of course, you know, I'm a Brady lover. But just so you know, I do rewatch other, you know, games besides the Patriots or Brady games. Number 13 was Mahomes and the Chiefs defeat Las Vegas in wild fourth quarter. I think that game was awesome. I I do think that game was really, really good. Uh, It was heartbreaking for Derek Carr, I believe, in that game. And it was one of those games where, well, you know, the Chiefs don't lose many football games now in the regular season. And when you think you have them on the ropes to win a game and you don't take advantage, that that's that's kind of tough. And and they're talking of course about the the game in late November. The Raiders really need to win this game for, you know, playoff implications. The Raiders actually got up early on them, went into the half with a lead, but, I mean, 28 points were scored in that fourth quarter. I I, I thought that was a fabulous game, too. I I think that ranking is is pretty fair at uh, 13. Number 12 was the Patriots' 24-point comeback to defeat Denver. This might be one of my most rewatched games of all time. Denver got up 24 nothing. Remember, this is the Peyton Manning MVP. 50 touch, 55 touchdowns. Went to the Super Bowl. High-flying, best-ranked offense ever. And they got a 24-point lead, 24 nothing at the half. And then Brady goes, all right, touchdown to Julian Edelman. All right, Brandon Bolden runs it. Boom, there's 24-14. All right, we're going to throw a bullet to Gronkowski. All right, there you go. There's uh, 24-21. All right, you want to give us the ball back? Here we go. Julian Edelman, one more time. Score, dive to the goal line. There you go. Now we have the lead, 28-24. Kick a field goal, make it 31-24. Peyton Manning comes back, leads a drive to tie it. Throws it to Demaryius Thomas over a keep to leave. Tie game, goes to overtime. Remember, this is Wes Welker's return to New England. Ryan Allen punched the ball in overtime. Tony Carter did not get out of the Peter slash poison call from Wes Welker when you wave it off and say, everyone get out of the way because this ball is bouncing. You don't know where it's going to bounce. It's a punted football. It could go anywhere. Tony Carter touched the ball, made it a live ball. Patriots recovered, kicked the field goal, won in overtime. That was an incredible game. And... Man, that was an awesome, awesome game. The next game was uh, on this list. 11 is the 49ers hold off a 28-point comeback versus the Patriots. And this was, I think, Randy Moss's return to New England, too. Now, Chris Collinsworth, who, of course, called this game with Al, said that he went down on the field for pregame and evaluated the weather. It was raining. It was as cold as you can get before the rain turns to frozen precipitation. It was maybe 35 degrees there, raining, windy. Comes back to the booth and says, Al, this game is going to be 10-7. I can't see any of these teams scoring more than more than that. And then next thing you know, it's 31-3 to in the second half. Patriots are losing. And then Tom Brady goes boom, 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 boom. Ties the game at 31. And then San Francisco regains the lead on a uh, LaMichael James run back, which set them up fantastically. And then, you know, Brady couldn't couldn't uh, come back and, and, and tie the game. And eventually he never did tie or take the lead. But that was a fantastic game of just 
both quarterback performances in a game where is not conducive for throwing the football. And they threw it everywhere. I mean, Brady put it up over 65 times. And, you know, that that was one of the tougher conditions to play in and one of the better games you'll see. Number 10 was Brett Favre inducted into Packers' ring of honor. Now, of course, that those types of games are, you know, pretty emotional. Uh, especially when you're, you know, you're being inducted and the quarterback there is the one who replaced you originally. And so this is, um, you know, they list these as top moments. Now, the game itself, I believe they even had Bart Starr there. And this was against the Packers, and, you know, it just made sense. Packers, oh, it was against the Bears, excuse me. I beg your pardon. You know, it was against the Bears. Brett Favre emotional. Bart Starr was there. Aaron Rodgers is there. The Green Bay Packers have been blessed with three Hall of Fame quarterbacks. And so, yes, I I understand this is a cool moment for, you know, Brett Favre and the Packers. I'm more into the games themselves than the moments, but I, I, I see 10 there. Nine. Close your ears. Bears fans, because this is the double doink. Now, again, this is a... I think this is a good game. A good game all around. And it came down to a kick, which, from Cody Parkey, I remember um, he had clanked the uprights several other times throughout the season. And, and, and you remember Al and Chris were freaking out. Because Al was literally like, how many times can, or I think Chris said, you know, that's impossible. How many times can you clank it off the uprights? And Al, to which I remember, said five. (laughs) Because I think Cody Parkey had clanked it five times that that season, which was uh, hilarious. I'm sorry, Bears fans. Let's get this list moving. Eight, Peyton Manning's return to Indianapolis as a Bronco. That was, you know, I watched that today. It was emotional. It was, again, Andrew Luck was there. And that got me thinking about a Brady return to New England. That was a great moment. I I even saw that, and I'm like, you know, the fans are thanking him. They're emotional. He's emotional. This is a fantastic moment. That was awesome. Seven Peyton Manning throws seven touchdowns versus Baltimore. That was to start his MVP campaign in 2013. And, you know, of course, the most touchdowns thrown in a game is tied by many at seven. And, you know, it's the Sheriff doing it on a new team. And uh, that was a good game. Well, you know, good performance by Peyton Manning. Six, Eli Manning and the Giants win Super Bowl 46. Now, this one hurts. This one hurts a lot. Thank you, NBC. (sighs) That was a great game. Undoubtedly, that was a fantastic game in which the Giants got up 9 nothing. They had the safety on the opening play for New England on offense. You had never seen a safety or an intentional grounding called when you throw a ball 50 yards down the middle of the field. It's usually called when you throw it out of bounds. 50 yards down the middle of the field. Intentional grounding called two points. There you go. Touchdown. 9 nothing. Tom Brady comes leading the troops back. And, you know, I think he had scored maybe, what was it, 17 unanswered. In Super Bowl Forty Six, you know, he threw a touchdown to Aaron Hernandez. He threw a touchdown to uh, Danny Woodhead. And then boom, bam, bop. It's 17-9. to nine. Patriots have a lead. 
And then, of course, we know the, the rest of this game, it was Mario Manningham down the sideline. Which got them, you know, move the ball. It was the West Welker drop game. And, you know, the, the Tom Brady was left with under 60 seconds to go to try and get a ball into the end zone. It came down with a Hail Mary. Gronkowski on a busted ankle. And, you know, that was all she wrote for that one. Number five was Seattle beats Minnesota in third coldest NFL game. This was the Blair Walsh game. So this is a list that has uh, several missed kicks in it. Minnesota was up 9 nothing. Seattle comes back, makes it 10-9. Minnesota gets in position. And, of course, this is Minnesota with Teddy Bridgewater. They were playing in that Minnesota College Stadium in January, right, because their dome had busted and their new stadium was being built. They get in position to kick a field goal. They were literally like 25 yards out, and Blair Walsh just hooks it unexplicably. Number four was the Philly special game. And again, not just the moment, but the entire game was really good. I don't need to, you know, break this one down moment by moment, but I mean, this was, think about the second half. And it, it goes back and forth, back... New England had the lead. Gronkowski scoring two touchdowns. At three receivers for New England going over 100 yards. And then the Philly special. That was a game changer. Brandon Graham with a strip sack. Incredible game all around. Next on the list, we have the Cardinals win 2016 divisional game on Larry Fitzgerald touchdown. Oh, boy, this was... If I'm thinking correctly... I believe they're talking about the, was this the Aaron Rodgers double Hail Mary game to Jeff Janis? And then Larry Fitzgerald scored in overtime on a shuttle pass. I mean, if so, that was a fantastic game. You never see two Hail Marys. In a row, yes, and they they are talking about the uh, Packers Cardinals, the game that was played in 2016, but it was the 2015 season. Aaron Rodgers threw two hail marys to get them into, you know, to tie the game. Game goes to overtime. Carson Palmer spins out of a sack and then throws a ball to Larry Fitzgerald, who runs it like 70 yards down the field. Next play later, it's a shuffle pass to Larry Fitzgerald, and he scores. Fantastic game. That is a game, another game I've rewatched. Really good being ranked third. Odell's one-handed catch is, you know, the best one-handed catch of all time. That's ranked number two on the list. And so I do see, you know, if there's a best of something of all time, like the best, this might be a best moment, It's or catch, best catch of all time, right? And then number one is not only one of the best moments or plays of all time, but the best game of all time, too. And that's the Patriots defeating the Seahawks in Super Bowl Forty Nine on Malcolm Butler's game-winning, goal-line, saving, interception. And, I mean, that game itself was spectacular. Just Brady's fourth quarter was probably the best performance of his entire career. Going 13 of 15 with two touchdowns. One to Amendola, the next to Julian Edelman. We've broken this play down a gazillion times. I don't need to talk more about that. But that, this is a fantastic list. Now, I think there are some early front runners here, or at least my voting would. You know, the Super Bowl 49 one is high on my list. The Cardinals Packers divisional game is high on my list. The double doink is going to be super high on my list. And. The 49ers Patriots game is going to be super high on my list. And the latest, uh, the 2019 NFC West title game, some might say, on the one, the goal line stand on Jacob Hollister is going to be super high on my list, too. The, the, those are my early favorites. Um, yeah, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. I might keep you post on how, how these go um, throughout the year or throughout the voting. 
excuse me. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, yeah, that's that's really it. I hope you enjoyed doing this as much as I did. I hope you love Sunday Night Football as much as I do. But anyways, I've had a great day with you so far today. And you should vote on the Sunday Night Football Instagram to get the games that I like voted highest. Anyways, thank you for listening to the GSMC Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, thank you. You know I will respond. All right, have a great day. Love you guys. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program